we'll we'll just wait a few minutes for for people to log on and then we'll start uh, introducing everyone. Hi, Greg. Hey. How are you? Okay. Hi, Mark. Hey, Joy. How are you? Hanging in, Ben. Joy, is your hair blue or is that just some kind of light? Blue. Oh, it is my blue. blue light, babe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's blue. It's COVID blue. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Hello, Michael. Michael. Hi, everyone. Looks like we're all here now. Should we do the um, MIT five minute rule? Yeah, so we'll, we'll just wait like another three minutes for people to log on and then we'll, we'll get started. Yeah. If, if people, if somebody wants to join, is there a link I can send somebody? That would be a question for Aaron. Uh, uh, I, have, I have the link. I can send it to you in the, the chat. Link. Yeah. Email it to me because there's somebody I think who wants to watch. Can I put it into the chat for you? Yeah, I have a link that is like that. It's like a calendar one, not the not the super secret ones that we were given. Not the super secret ones. Yeah. So you get you're sending me that in an email. It's in the chat. It's in the chat. Oh, it's in the chat. Oh my god, so complicated. Chat. Okay. Um. Greg, is there any way of getting more light on your face? You you kind of look like you're in in a in a dark um, academic See. tower. That work? It puts a bright light behind your head, but it doesn't <laughs> really. It doesn't actually light up your face. I don't know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> I I. My Zoom life has been mostly from my home computer. Now that I'm back in the office, it's, you know, I am in a dark cubicle, dark room without windows. With no ventilation. There's ventilation when it works. But like, did they ever do anything about it? <laughs> That's always the question I have. I don't want to know. Oh. It's too scary. Sir, where are you? I'm uh, over in the townhouse over on the west side. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> recognize the cloud paintings in the background, right? Yeah, a little familiar. <laughs> so wait, you guys, tell me who you are. Sure. So actually, we were just about to start with introduction. So um, I'm Krista, and uh, this is Miranda, our co-host, hey. or my co-host. And uh, we wanted to welcome the panelists, as well as the audience, uh, for joining us today for this HIV AIDS advocacy panel event. So um, while the last few people are hopping on Zoom, we wanted to start by thanking uh, the organizations that are sponsoring this event. And that includes the MIT Institute Community and Equity Office, the Biological Engineer Grad Student Board, LBGTQ plus services, LGBTQ plus grad, and the Woman and Gender Study Program at MIT. Um, and we'd also like to thank our co-organizers, Felicia Rodriguez and Owen Letty, as well as Aaron Perillo, who has been helping with technical support. 
Um, so before we start, we wanted to read the MIT land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a one step in understanding the long history that has brought us to reside on this land and a step in um, helping us understand our place in history. So the MIT Indigenous People uh, Advocacy Committee in partnership with MIT's American in Indian Science and Engineering Society and the Native American Students Association and other Indigenous MIT students and alumni have developed the following land acknowledgement statement with the ICEO to be read at the start of MIT events. MIT acknowledges indigenous people as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional unseceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. And since we're not all on MIT land right now because uh, it's virtual, we're going to put a link in the chat just so that if you're interested, you can search the map of what land you're currently on. Um, as well, we do not have a professional closed captioner with us this afternoon, but there is a Zoom auto transcription um, that has recently greatly, uh, greatly improved and you can access that by hitting the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Okay, and then lastly, uh, if we have time at the end of the discussion, we'll open up for audience questions but uh, please feel free throughout the program to add questions to the Q&A box and uh, audience can upvote questions uh, that you would like to hear the answers to from our panelists. Thank you, Krista. So hello everyone, I'm Miranda Dawson. I'm the co-president of LGBTQ plus grad at MIT. And moderating with me today is Krista Pollan, who is an HIV researcher here at MIT as well. The development of drugs and treatment for HIV AIDS would be nowhere without the community engagement through activism and art. Diseases that impact marginalized populations are often swept under the rug by people in power. And thus it is critical that we bridge the gap between studying the virus in a lab and advocating for those that are actually impacted by the disease. As such, it is our pleasure to introduce today's panelists a group of accomplished HIV AIDS advocates who have spent their careers working at the intersections of research, art, and activism. Oh, Krista, you're muted. Classic Zoom. Uh, <laughs> I'll start by introducing uh, panelist Mark Harrington, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Treatment Action Group, or TAG, um, which is an independent activist and community-based research and policy uh, think tank committed to fighting HIV and other infectious diseases. We also have with us Joy Episala, who is an AIDS activist and visual artist who serves as a founding member of Fierce Pussy, which is a collective of queer woman artists. We also have today with us Sir Rodney, who is a writer, curator, and archivist who has worked on the Visual AIDS Project and is a member of the artist collective, What Would an HIV Doula Do? We are also joined by Greg Gonzalez, who is the executive, sorry, who is the co-founder of TAG and associate professor of epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health, as well as Michael Cox, who is the executive director of Black and Pink, uh, Massachusetts and serves as a member of the Special Commission to study the health and safety of LGBTQI prisoners. And we look forward to hearing more about the work of our accomplished panelists as we delve into our discussion today. But we would like to begin by giving them a chance to introduce themselves. Yeah, and so in introducing yourself, we wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to share if you identify as an artist, researcher, activist, or some combination of these, and how you chose your particular approach in the space of HIV uh, AIDS advocacy. So we'll start with Joy, who has actually shared uh, with us some images. So. Yes. 
So take it away, Joy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I, I identify as um, she, they, and queer, as well as an artist and an activist. And I thought I'd just show two examples of work that are from two series. Um, that's, I've been adding to for many years. Um, the Curtain series, the one, I don't know how you're reading this, but I guess on your left, um, I probably started that in 93 and it was really based on a curtain in a hospital room. You know, the curtains that are supposedly there to divide a patient from another patient or give some kind of privacy, but actually you can hear everything, right? So even though here are these supposed boundaries, there are no boundaries. And, um, I would say that's the same for working as an activist and as an artist that probably in the early 90s when I was working with ACT UP and then eventually TAG, um, I thought I was compartmentalizing my art from my activism, but in fact, it's completely, there. there's a whole synergy between them and my work um, as an activist, as an AIDS activist, has totally influenced my art and my life. Um, so the Curtain series was based on these ideas of permeability and inside and outside and um, the, the space, the very small space between things and people and um, patient and patient or um, even, you know, what I show you, what I don't show you. So there's a lot of intimacy in that, but there's also um, maybe a type of protection. I don't know, but they're all very different. Um, this is probably the, the 30th one in the series. Uh, you can go to my website. There's a couple more there, but um, yeah. So I've kept shooting them and they were, were very much based on this, um, spending a lot of time in the hospital taking care of friends. And then the pillow series also kind of came out of that. And, you know, these two pillows, like, there's a number of them in the series. They sit on the floor, they lean against the wall. They're quite sculptural. I've always tried to push photography and video into a sculptural zone. And um, the pillow pieces were very much about those stains that are left behind, um, absence and presence. Um, is it from sex or love or sleep drooling or uh, sickness? Um, these very mundane objects that we're all surrounded by, but we leave our imprint on. And I think it's that kind of imprint of memory and the way we think about people that we've known or people that we know now, it, all of those things. Um, they're constant reminders, I think. And as a witness, um, I feel like I'm responsible in a sense as an artist and an activist and a human in the world to keep talking about what people have been through at the height of the AIDS crisis, but also into the now and how, um, how all those things can connect up and how we can you know, do work together and move on. Would you like us to show um, the two two of the other pictures that you provided, or do you want other I panelists? I save those for later on in the conversation if those questions that you sent me kind of. Okay. Maybe that's interesting. Sure. So, anyone else, uh, if they would like to introduce themselves next? Okay, I'll go. Um, I'm Sir Rodney Sir. Um, I um, wear a lot of different hats. My gender pronouns are he, they. Um, I wear a lot of different hats. As I said, I'm a combination of things, an artist, a researcher, an archivist, never an activist, writer, curator, collaborator, lover, and most often an existentialist wearing a surrealist hat. Even though a lot of the work that I do is um, 
community activism. It's something I engage in. I don't read myself as an activist. I feel that that's a label that the community puts on you, which I'm fine with. Um, I came into this into the AIDS uh, care situation through being a co-director of a very high profile gallery in the East Village in the 80s. And by 1988, it was raging out of control so much that I couldn't sit and work in the gallery all day while I had friends that were I'd say dying in their apartments, not able to get out of bed. So I felt uh, my friends were more important than any money or anything that I was doing at the gallery and I left to take care of my friends. So I spent a lot of time, um, a lot of my friends were artists and I think basically my real, my real goal was not only to assist them and aid them in helping with their doctor's appointments or loyal things or will concerns, uh, navigating things with family. So I was sort of doing doula work in a way, but I was really interested in organizing their records so that after they were gone, there would be some kind of organization of the records that could be presented to a gallery or used to help the estate or the family understand the work better and make it more accessible. Um, through doing that for a number of years led me to be introduced to Frank Moore and David Hirsch, who were wanted to start something called the Visual AIDS Archive Project. And the actual uh, turnover of a lot of the ex a lot of the board in Visual AIDS um, over to a new board that was running basically the Archive Project as, as its main focus. Um, those meetings happened in my apartment on Two Fifth Avenue in, I guess, 1992 or three, I'm not exactly remembering. So I worked with, with, with visual aids for more than a decade. I served on their board. Um, my partner, my late partner, Jeff Hendricks, and I worked um, at the very early stage of the archive project with basically a mission to use the archive project to set up a number of exhibitions. So we tried to activate things in the archive by, by curating these exhibitions and also having some kind of traveling show of something called light boxes, because originally we were, we, tried to, we were trying to document as much work as we could before it disappeared. And that became, um, the records of this are what we showed in, in, in our traveling light box show. Uh, we didn't know, there, there wasn't any criteria for being a part of the archive project, except that you were an artist with HIV or AIDS. Um, some wanted to disclose, some wanted to be a part of the project and not disclose. So we have a kind of back end for people that don't want to disclose, but the majority of them do disclose. And it's, become, and it's now set up on this website that's uh, very active with a lot of programs uh, that support artists and uh, do publications and have cur curators come in every month to curate exhibitions that are launched on the web of their website. Um, that continued and I continue working on the archives that I've built with a lot of these artists that I worked with back in the 80s. And uh, out of that and my work with that, I joined another group um, of people that you know, are directly affected by the, by the AIDS crisis, either as, as a caregivers or they're working in the field with the service organizations or in research around HIV and AIDS. And we just meet to kind of like check in with each other, do things together. Sometimes we create programs together. We invite people to speak. It's sort of like a party thing, but now we're more project-based and we do a lot of public events. Our last one was done at the uh, Creative Times Red Stage that set up at Cooper Square. We had a table where we talked to people about HIV and AIDS and used prompts to get them to talk about their experiences, what they remember, what they'd like to hear, what their fears were. And actually it was quite active because we find out there's this real need for people, particularly the younger generation, to know more. They have a lot of questions. 
there's a lot of things that they don't understand. They understand that we're still in, in um, living in a society where a lot of us are, where many of us are HIV positive. I'm not, I'm HIV negative. But it's sort of like the shadow community that exists that no one really wants to talk about because of all the stigma. And I think part of the work that I do is trying to bring the conversation about AIDS as something that can be as easy as talking about where to find a cup of coffee, right? Uh, so that's an important part of my work. And I do a lot of it through art because I'm centered in the art world. So I try to do it through creative projects. Thank you um, for that introduction to your work. And um, would anybody else like to introduce themselves? Hey, this is Mike with Black and Pink. Um, I would just add a little bit more. So me being the ED of Black and Pink Massachusetts is almost the end of my story. Um, but I got started uh, on this path many years ago. So just being a product of the system, uh, growing up in every state system you could think of as a youth. And uh, as an adult, I quickly got involved in crystal meth, uh, which is a common thing for gay guys to get into. Um, I got involved in sex work and it was through all of that um, that I ended up contracting HIV. And uh, that, that quickly also led me to being incarcerated. So just kind of living that lifestyle. Um, and it was actually uh, when I was incarcerated that I was diagnosed. And so it sort of has this very much uh, interconnectedness uh, to it, uh, the incarceration and being diagnosed. And so it was through all of my treatment, um, or maltreatment rather, in the system. Uh, I did six years upstate in state prison. Mm -hmm. And it was just bizarre. It was like Kafka-esque, uh, seeing what happens to incarcerated people. Um, even people that are like minding their own business, like walking from one building to another to see just the, the abuse that can happen from guards. Um, and so when I wrapped up uh, my time in state prison, I got connected with Black and Pink. Uh, they're actually a national org that have chapters throughout the country. And it just felt like the most perfect space for me um, as someone who is queer, someone who's living with HIV and has survived the prison system. And it just really like provides a platform for us to sing our songs. And so as the question asked, if we are activists, researchers or artists, you know, I definitely identify as an activist. Um, but looking at all of those options, it all just feels like storytelling. You know, they're, whether you're telling someone else's story, your own um, or some combination. And so I always feel like I'm singing songs, sort of. Like, it's my Icaros that I'm singing out there in the world. And I hope people, you know, listen in sometimes. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, would uh, Dr. Greg Gonsalves or Mark Harrington like to introduce themselves? Sure. Go ahead, Mark. You go, Greg. Hey, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Greg Gonzalez. I'm uh, a faculty member at the Yale School of Public Health, um, where, where my work focuses on the intersection of um, substance use and infectious diseases, um, but also um, deal with issues of incarceration um, and its relationship with substance use and infectious disease. Um, I do quantitative modeling on a lot of that um, uh, and have a MIT grad is one of my postdocs right now. Um, also teach a class called Political Epidemiology and, and how you can use quantitative techniques um, and the methods of causal inference to tie social and economic policies to um, harmful health outcomes. But none of that really uh, uh, is as important as the education I got when I was hanging out with Joy and Mark um, in ACT UP and in Treatment Action Group and with Frank Moore and uh, all the old gang, um, where we learned about uh, how the world works um, and who gets left behind, who's thought of as disposable, uh, and um, how um, a virus isn't destiny, uh, and how you can shape uh, the future, not just for yourself, but for your community if you fight back. Um, and um, 
if anything, I'm proud of in my life is the work we did together um, many, many years ago to deal with an epidemic, which is still raging around the world, um, which is still raging in this country. Um, if you're a young African-American uh, uh, gay man in this country, by the time you're 40, you're, 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 you're more than likely to be um, HIV positive. Um, and um, we keep forgetting that the HIV epidemic is not history, it's our present. Um, and it matters um, to some and it ma doesn't matter to others because of who, who, who is the, the predominant population who's, who's facing the disease now. Um, and I think as we're in the midst of a new pandemic called COVID-19, we just see these disparities um, rising up again. Um, and a lot of my work over the past year has been um, flashback material um, and watching institutions, um, leaders fuck us over once again, um, and particularly fuck over people who they think are disposable, whether it's black and brown people or prisoners, uh, people are incarcerated, people who use drugs, sex workers, um, and the poor. Um, um, and so I don't know if I, I'm, I, I guess I'm a researcher, I guess I'm an activist. I don't think I'm an artist, but I, I, I love many artists, including, okay. including Julie. Thank you. Mark? Thanks, Greg. Um, just um, as a matter of beginning, I would say uh, TAG uh, Treatment Action Group is a New York City based nonprofit that works on the interface of HIV and some other syndemics, including uh, the viral hepatitis syndemic, particularly hepatitis C and tuberculosis. And more recently, we've gotten into broader kind of uh, public health issues <clears throat> related to harm reduction in the, the war on drugs, the opioid overdose crisis. Um, the housing crisis. And as Greg said, um, you know, many of the disparities which drove us into our AIDS work in the 80s and the 90s um, remain latent in our country and only to spring out with even more um, malice in the last 15 months. I would say that one thing that really became shockingly clear over the last 18 months was that <clears throat> the administration that was in power then and, and many of the most important economic institutions in our country really would rather just keep the economy open no matter what the uh, cost and death was. And I think the big shock for those of us who survived the AIDS crisis was that it wasn't just a matter of having gay people or people of color, uh, drug users and people with hemophilia or children and women mostly of color be these uh, victims that were not thought to have any worth, lives without value. It turned out that even, even the people that were voting for the last president, even their lives didn't matter in the most recent pandemic. And so I, I think we kind of saw a level of evil in our country that um, has been building up for a long time, but um, was certainly there during the 80s and the 90s. And all the issues that we're facing now are partly about how to get out of the mess that was given to us starting under, under the years of President Reagan. My own involvement with ACT UP really stemmed out of friendships with people that were getting sick and had nowhere to go. And I didn't know what to do about it. So I went and joined ACT UP in, in 1988. And through ACT UP, I found a practice, uh, a group of um, loving brothers and sisters and comrades and learned how to do a new kind of activism, which is, um, is both civil rights activism and also science-based activism, which focuses on trying to uh, force the in uh, scientific institutions in society most of which are run by the government and some of which are run by private pharmaceutical companies to respond to this huge health crisis that wasn't getting attention or investment. And um, it took about uh, you know, 15 years for there to be effective treatment for HIV. <clears throat> um, 800,000 Americans approximately have died of HIV since the beginning. 34 million people have died around the world and although many would, would declare this story of the de development of effective treatment and now prevention with antiretroviral treatment to be one of the great success stories of biomedicine, it has not been a great story for global solidarity or, or indeed, as Greg mentioned, national solidarity. And there's many, many people in our own country and around the world who are not benefiting from these advances because of in inequities in the health system. 
I would also add that um, in TAG, since our footprint is in Manhattan, we are on the land of the Lenape people, who were the indigenous people that lived here before the colonists came. Um, the kind of solidarity movements that are erupting around the country and around the world um, today are, are very important for people that work in the aid space to understand and to ally with. And um, I don't think of myself as an artist, although I um, have made art and did, I contributed some art uh, during um, my act of years in, in conjunction with Grand Fury with the the bloody fist and um, and uh, the read read my lips poster, but I do art is is a practice of mine. I, I don't think my photography has as much to do with AIDS as say Joy's work has to do with the epidemic. But it uh, for me, I find my my art is kind of a practice that helps me to kind of calm down and re, re, regain my um, equilibrium and. Although our work has changed a lot over the years, I, I'd say that I'm very, very proud of the work that HIV community has done and the solidarity that it's shown to its members and also its communities. And I do think it's um, it's changed a paradigm in medical research, although there's an enormously long way to go. And I welcome this panel and I'm uh, very honored to be among the other speakers here today. Thank you. Thank you all for your introductions. Um, you're all very impressive advocates in this space and all have such you know diverse approaches, yet they're kind of cohesive in that you've all had to work together in unique ways to make the progress that you did. And so the next question I want to ask is around this idea of collaboration and kind of in what ways have you had to work with people across different disciplines or, you know, different concentrations, whether it be art, activists, researchers, to achieve these goals? And so if anyone can maybe comment on, on you know, working across those boundaries. Well, I, I'd just like to say that um, a couple of things really occur to me as I listen to everyone in their introductions is that coming into the space of ACT UP, I mean, I've done, I had done other activism before entering into ACT UP was more, um, you know, having to do with feminism and anti-war stuff, anti-nuke stuff. And so by the time I found myself at ACT UP, I, I felt like um, I'd found my tribe and that what I knew how to do I could use to help move things forward. And this idea of working collaboratively with this group of people um, to, to me came very naturally, but also what I've always found interesting is that you probably didn't know what other people did outside of that room. You just knew what people brought into that room to make things happen and move forward. And so, um, that, that's a very interesting kernel, I think, in the way in which people have worked together um, and, and how all of us have worked together. Um, also, what started, I mean, when you talk about collaboration, so I was in an affinity group called the Marys. Um, we worked together, this group of people. So basically an affinity group was, um, you would plan another action that was probably more covert and probably possibly more likely to get arrested than maybe the larger demonstration or thing, other things that were being put together by the larger group. Um, and the other thing that happened alongside of ACT UP was Fierce Pussy. So there was another way of collaborating and that came out of um, women in that room who were artists, who were queer probably, possibly not, whatever. Um, but an open call saying, come and let's meet at someone's apartment and um, we're going to work together to talk about visibility. And so um, 
it was a parallel course. So, you know, you'd go to an ACT UP meeting and you may go to your job and maybe you worked in your studio and then maybe you went to the hospital and then maybe you would go to a Fierce Pussy meeting. And this is all happening at the same time. And Fierce Pussy started in 91. Um, and there was a lot of people who came in and out of it. And uh, I, would, I can show that truck Im image if you'd like, um, just to show sort of an earlier piece um, that, so the truck image is from, I think it's actually 94, but it, the, the AIDS poster on the back really speaks to how, how it was at that time and, and what that's about. Um, can, I don't know, can you read that? Or do you want me to read it? It's, it's a, it's a, so the way things worked was that we would meet at someone's apartment, talk about ideas, literally make a poster the same night. And then myself and Carrie Yamaoka, who's also part of Fierce Pussy, worked at GQ Magazine and Traveler respectively. And we would run all these posters off there for free. And we'd also run off packed up posters. So Condé Nast doesn't maybe know it, but they underwrote a lot of the um, posters that ended up being wheat pasted up by ACT UP and Fierce Pussy. And so we would meet this group of people. And like I said, it was people coming in and out, whoever wanted to participate. And um, so we run the poster off, then we'd meet again the following week and we'd wheat paste it up in some neighborhood. And in this case, this was the first time we actually worked in color. Um, we did everything with our own means. Um, so a lot of the early posters were typed out on a typewriter and then those little typewriter pages were brought to a Xerox machine at Condé Nast and blown up. And then we take it from there and go out wheat pasting near someone's apartment where there was some water and there'd be a group of us and someone to look as the, uh, to look out for the cops and while the other people just wheat pasted. And, and, and those days you could wheat paste. That's another thing. I mean, things would get wheat pasted on the street and that was the way you communicated. There was no, uh, Instagram or Facebook. I mean, that was the Instagram and Facebook and the way of communication at the time. And now, you know, you can post posters online and have people distributed. We've always been interested in having other people disseminate. Um, so anyway, that poster is really based back in the, probably the height 1993. Um, and so this is 94, this is like the year after, it's based on a page from a calendar. And it says, um, start an IV, hold a hand, pick out a coffin, bury your best friend. AIDS, tired of the routine, be enraged, become explosive. And I honestly think that that message is probably accurate for other, for parts of the world right now. Um, who aren't having the advantage of medication and any kind of health system and all kinds of things. I mean, I think there's probably something in this message we can even apply to what's happened with COVID. Um, so there's that. And then more recently, um, there's this broadsheet where what we've been thinking about was, Fierce Pussy's always thought about the voice and who we were trying to communicate with. And in this case, it was a way to make anybody come across this text and have a way of relating and maybe getting an idea of how one might situate themselves in this space. So um, those ways of collaborating become larger because it's not just the people that you collaborate with on an everyday basis. In Fierce Pussy now, it's there's four of us. There's Carrie Yamaoka, Zoe Leonard, and Nancy Brooks Brody. And we were kind of brought back together in 2008. And we've been working together ever since. And then in terms of collaboration, working in ACT UP and still knowing the people that are left that I've worked with that I've continued to work with over the years, not only in TAG, on the board of TAG, but also we've done other demonstrations, actions, things that, you know, where, we're, where we needed to put our bodies and our talents forward. Um, and that just continues. So um, 
collaboration is a good thing, I would say. Definitely. And, and I'm wondering if anyone else here has a, a comment on collaboration from, from their experience. Greg, yeah. So it's more recent, but again, it harkens back to the past. If you let me share my screen. Yes, go ahead. Um, let's see. If you're not able to share, you can also send it to, to one of us and we can we can try to share it. I'll send it to you now, um, but I'll tell the story and then. Um, so um, as Mark will know, um, many of us have worked on issues around drug approval in the United States for a long time. Um, and not only speeding access to drugs, making sure we get answers about them. And this has been sort of an ongoing piece of work that um, many of us have done trying to get access to drugs, but answers about them and been fighting with basically the FDA and members of Congress, libertarian think tanks for three years, four years. Um, last week, a, a drug was approved by the FDA for Alzheimer's disease, which has no proof that it works. <laughs> um, There's a firestorm uh, in the in the press about it. Um, one of the um, advisory committee members at the FDA resigned, Aaron Kesselheim, a faculty member at Harvard. Um, so it's not uh, 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 an, an issue from the 1980s and 1990s. We worked on these issues in the context of um, our class here at the law school and at the public health school, but we realized we needed a little bit of extra. Uh, and I'm dying to show this to you, but I'm trying I'll tell you be a co-host now. Do you have the green button, the magical green button at the bottom? Can you Beautiful. see it? Yes. Yeah. So um, what do you see? Just my whole screen or just the? The double arches. So we spoke to a friend of ours named Avram Finkelstein, who everybody on this panel probably knows, except for um, uh, Mike. Um, who's an artist and writer and AIDS activist and said, Avram, we need help. This is a uh, really technical issue about regulatory policy, et cetera. And like, we need to get something across to, to average people in the United States about why this is important. Um, and Avram came up, worked with our law students and our public health students, our art students. And we did something that Avram calls a flash collective where you put all this expertise in a room. And then um, Avram wrote four letters on the board, WKKD, what would Kim Kardashian do? And said, I want you to think of the FDA drug approval through um, the lens of social media and, and, and the current sort of media climate. And we did lots of images together. And this is one of the images from that day. Um, he said, what do people know about? Um, what's something that people can recognize a million miles away? And it's the double arches. Mm -hmm. And we came up with the idea of drive-through drug approval. Um, for, from a technical perspective, it means knowing less and less about what we put in our bodies. But we were able to take the work of Avram, um, which he has put to use over, over decades now in the service of social justice, uh, for a very technical issue that straddled law and public health. Um, and there's a whole set of images I won't, I won't bore you with, um, but um, it's a key part of the collaboration in um, the work we do here um, to, to, to use the academic platform for uh, leverage for social justice, but realize we have to basically pull from art, from public health, from law, from all over the place to yeah. sort of um, to push out past the sort of structures of power, which basically want to keep us silent and keep us shut shut up and keep us from, from raising these issues. I mean, it's also super interesting how the visual, how that plays, right? So anybody can relate to that visual, um, and but it comes from this whole group of people working together to put that out there. But it is also about that, that flipping between, yeah, what does everybody know? What does somebody recognize? McDonald arches, and then how does that play out? Um, yeah, and we had jo we had Joy and Fierce Pussy come up and talk to our students. Um, 
again, these were long public health students, not art students. I mean, some art students were in the room, but the idea was that um, communicating in this, in this world needs more than what your discipline might offer. Mm -hmm. And how one can support the other and, and push it forward, get it farther out there. That's a, that's a beautiful sentiment that um, what you're doing is more than your discipline, even though that's how we organize ourselves and in our society. And, and I think something really powerful that's come through is the importance of supporting each other and kind of building these, these networks. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I, I wanted to add in a bit about the small groups, because I think <clears throat> it's really, um, I think that most people remember ACT UP for the large demonstrations. And even, even the form of mobilization within the large demonstration would be that uh, these small affinity groups, um, which were voluntary groups of people who joined up together just because they wanted to, um, kind of carried out their own um, separate, you know, sub-branded demonstrations at the larger demonstrations. So there were different images, different um, issues. Um, for example, when we stormed the NIH, um, I, and I would love to do a panel like this where we had like a zillion slides that we could show you, but there was like, you know, one group that uh, set up a caterpillar and each, each segment of the caterpillar had the name of an understudied opportunistic infection. And the creativity of these small groups um, really was, was what contributed to the power of the demonstrations. Um, but not only that, the small groups that were formed like the ones that uh, Joy mentioned, um, often became care groups that would take care of individuals um, that were sick or dying. And um, this brought people incredibly close together at, at the often, in some ways, the worst uh, time of all of our lives, but um, created incredible strength in community and love. And Joy's group did a, a series of amazing um, political funerals where they actually brought the bodies of several different members of the Marys to say President Bush's ha uh, campaign headquarters in, in November of 1992 or John Greenberg's to um, the, the tree in the middle of Tompkins Square where John Kelly sang a beautiful version of Wigstock in which he imagined um, the end of AIDS or even a very dramatic one where they took Tim Bailey's body to Washington DC. Um, I love that picture actually. There's yeah. Yeah. Joy, do you want to tell them? Well, um, the Marys uh, lost. I mean, maybe there were sixteen of us, and half half of the half of them are gone. Um, and by ninety two, ninety one. 92, we were getting very tired of just going to memorial services. Um, that didn't cut it anymore um, because we were just watching everybody around us get ill and then get sick and then die. And I, we were seeing that within the Marys. And um, around the same time, I think it was 91, David Von Rovich came out with his book, Close to the Knives. And we actually had attended a reading of his in um, at the drawing center, and he read that passage about you know every time I wish every time um, a person died of AIDS, their lovers' friends would drive a hundred miles an hour down to Washington D.C. DC and you know dump their lifeless body on the White House steps, and it, it was like that moment of hearing something that crystallized exactly how we were already thinking. And as wild as that may sound, that was the level of desperation and anger. Uh, and you know, how, how to shake people into recognizing that this wasn't going away and you know, something had to happen and things had to, you know, catalysts had to happen. And, Anyway, um, there were three funerals. One, the, one of the first things that was a memorial uh, procession for David Ronorovich, because David was too sick to make a decision to do something else. Um, we called it Stump Cane after Dennis 
Kane and, and John Stump, who were members of the Marys, and we advertised it on the back of Anonymous Queers broadsheet, which was actually Avram Finkelstein and Vincent Gagliostro. And that was Gay Pride 92, I believe, and, um, or 91, and I, yeah, 92. And then we thought crazily enough that this small group of people, we were gonna carry this out for other people who wanted this, a political funeral. And we did all the requisite, um, you know, figuring out how, how one would do this and whatever. But of course it was like a dummy, dummy run for one of us. And um, in fact, it was Mark Fisher who died coming back from Rome on a plane while Timothy was in the hospital um, with a collapsed lung. I mean, it was insane. And that was November, the, no, the end of October, right before the election for Clinton. And um, that was the first funeral we did it the night of election night um, where we carried um, Mark's coffin up Sixth Avenue to Bush's headquarters at 45th Street. And there's footage of this. James Wensey shot a lot of this. I mean, I won't go into detail as so much, but anyway, just to say that Timothy's was in Washington, that's what Timothy wanted. And um, he paid for the buses for all the activists to go down to Washington, DC. And then we picked him up <laughs> at the funeral home and drove in a van with all of us down to Washington where we <laughs> got to the Capitol um, reflecting pool. All Everybody was there and uh, we were surrounded by all kinds of cops and there's footage of all that. It was insane. But, um, you know, and Clinton was then in power and wouldn't even let us get Tim. We wanted to do a procession like Kennedy's down Pennsylvania Avenue to the front of the White House. We weren't gonna throw his body, of course, over the fence, but we were gonna have it lie in state in front of it so that people would know what it was like to see someone die of AIDS. And I, th I think that the other thing that was so powerful about these political funerals was it was a way for John and Mark and Tim to continue to be activists even after death, how they wanted themselves to move forward in space and put their bodies on the line for real, right? In a whole, in a way that was very powerful and um, you know, and we were there to facilitate that. It's extremely powerful. And thank you for sharing that. And um, there's a lot of pain um, involved in a lot of this work um, that I think that image that you showed expressed a very powerful moment. And I kind of want to bring Sir in actually right now, if that's okay, because you've done so much work trying to preserve the art of, of people and, and maintain that legacy. And I think that's so important. So if you can maybe speak on that. Um, well, like I said, at the, this, a lot of the artists that I was working with who were affected by the AIDS crisis were like kind of my generation. So we were all in our what? 20s, 30s at the time. And it was really, we weren't, a lot of us weren't prepared to disappear. Or, or, or to die so early. So, and when many of my, when many of the artists got sick, they didn't have time to focus on their work or organizing anything. And I felt that that was really important because I'm really concerned with legacy. You know, what lives on after the artist, after the artist is deceased, there has to be the work, but there's also a lot of supporting material. So I focused on that. Um, I think most of my collaboration, because I was not a member of ACT UP, although I would say that like 80% of my friends were, particularly my gay friends. So I, I knew what was happening with the group through that, but I spent more time in doctors, with doctors, uh, lawyers' offices, 
memorials, uh, that sort of thing. But the collaboration, I mean, if we're talking about collaboration here, there's always in a collaboration you get involved with, with the artist. I mean, you know, in organizing a lot of these exhibitions, um, as a curator, I work very closely with artists um, and try to, try to bring a lot of their ideas to fruition. I mean, the last big show that I curated was for the 25th anniversary of Visual AIDS at La Galerie La Mama. And it was interesting to do that show because I was working with a lot of artists that were the same age as the artists that I remember in the 80s. And um, in working with them, I tried to get them to, I tried to find out from them what they remembered of artists from the 80s. And the same names would come up, you know, Maplethorpe, Keith Haring, Felix Gonzalez Torres, but they really didn't know anything and that shocked me. So I started bringing a lot of the artists that were deceased from the earlier generation and introducing them to this younger generation. And some of them actually got so um, excited by what they were seeing and being introduced to these other artists that they started doing like works and homage to them. Um, their ideas in terms of what they wanted to develop when I talked to them about being a part of the show would continually change. And because I'm so supportive of artists, I would just kind of push them to go with where their, uh, where their work was taking them around this, this show. And surprisingly, when the work arrived in the gallery, I would say that like more than 50% of it I hadn't seen. So I had to rely that the artists would turn out something great. And when you support artists, you know, you get amazing stuff. So maybe that's one form of collaboration. I don't know. Uh, uh, so my collaborations are basically basically one-on-one -on -one rather than with collectives. I mean, I've been a part of collectives. Like I've, I've been, I've, I'm a part of um, other countries that is, a, that is a writing collective of black gay writers that Marlon Riggs centered his tongues untied around. A lot of the people that were in that video are now deceased, but a lot of the members in the group are still alive. Um, we sort of aren't as visible anymore, but we're still out there. Um, but uh, no, my collaborations basically, we'll have to say, are, are working through art and artists and getting them excited about doing projects and maybe approaching them about uh, you know, making studio visits to encourage them to just as encouragement, I guess. That's a collaboration. And then trying to find some way to get their work out there. And you've, but you've also worked with visual aids for so many years and you've helped organize the postcard benefit and you're working with all those artists and you're putting up all that art and you're, you know, communicating with a lot of people and I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like to keep myself, um, I'm, I'm just sort of amazed at how many people out there uh, respect and honor the work that I do and are so excited to meet me. That always sort of takes me aback. But I'm, um, because I'm not in a position where I'm publicly accessible, like when I was in the gallery, people have to sort of like know where to find me. And they find me at public events, like at a, a show when something's happening or at a talk when something's happening. But other than that, I'm, I'm kind of like hard to find. But I do um, do a lot of organizing. I do, I, I'm on a lot of panels, particularly when they uh, talk about the history of the East Village scene, which happens over and over and over again. And I seem to be the only one in the panel that ever brings up AIDS. It's like the people don't want to talk about it. You know what I'm saying? You cannot talk about that period without mentioning AIDS. You cannot show all the work of all the parties that we had without mentioning that more than half the people that we're looking at in those pictures are dead. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like shocking to me. And, and I kind of figured out in, in my head that a lot of people don't want to go back there and talk about that um, because they feel guilty about what they didn't do when they could have during that period. 
so they just rather erase it away. Um, but usually when I have done that at panels and brought it up, there's usually like a standing ovation because it's like this quiet thing that people don't want to talk about still. It's really, really very difficult. It has to be something that's centered on HIV and AIDS. But if it's centered around the production of art and uh, the production of art really because the 80s was such an explosion, there was such a multiplicity of different kinds of art forms. It's like everything was kind of happening. It seemed to, it, it seemed to be the epicenter that, that exploded into what it's grown into now. Um, but I can't talk about that explosion without talking about how much of it died and how much of the history has been erased because of AIDS. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's shocking to me that there's all these artists that existed back then that are still not in the mainstream consciousness. I mean, I look at the show that David Zwerner's working on now, and I've worked with them on the timeline, that's trying to um, bring into light some really incredible artists that are rarely talked about. You know, Frank Moore, uh, Murray, uh, Murray, uh, Marlon Riggs, filmmaker, uh, to, what's his name? The Here, isn't it Hugh Steer, Mark Morriso? Um, Hugh, Hugh Steers is another one that's really yeah. kind of fallen by the wayside, and his stuff is so direct. And I think that that really is the most in your face thing to do to remind these people that did nothing of what was really happening and make them feel more guilty. And I sort of like. <laughs> You know, Derek Jarman, another one. Right, he's the other one. That's right. So anyways, um, you know, in terms of collaboration, you know, I get involved in projects like that. So it's a collaborative thing because I'm working on putting together a timeline and I'm also working with them to try and find some of the material that they're using for their, uh, for the display. Uh, so I leave myself as an open access person to work on projects and I'm getting invited all the time to talk on panels, to brainstorm with people ideas, to sit on little commit committees. So I work more in the back end. I'm not so much into the putting myself out there in the body in terms of demonstration because I feel that I'm targeted as a black man with the coughs. And I'm also like a Canadian, so I'm a resident alien. And I don't, I can't afford to jeopardize that. So I've stayed more in the background. But all of that, all of that is important. It's not like one is more than the other. It's all, all necessary. Oh, no, 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 I, I'm very clear that the work that I've done in the background has been very necessary to move a lot of things forward. Totally. Um, you know, I'm a very good organizer um project manager and i'm a kind of a workaholic i get charged up having a new project i'm very good at, at making projects start to work then once they start working then i lose interest i'm looking for something else that i can start it's sort of like that yeah that sounds similar to um i think how a lot of researchers at mit feel with, with the different challenges that you know we're we're working on solving um, so like a lot of what we've heard uh, so far is like how important it is in HIV and AIDS advocacy to, you know, uh, maintain the history of, of what has happened. Um, but also we wanted to hear from uh, Mike actually about kind of uh, looking forward, what work is being done today and like what the biggest challenges uh, we see with the HIV and AIDS uh, advocacy. Sure, thanks for that question. So uh, Black and Pink works at the intersection of the criminal legal system and uh, people living with HIV and people who identify as LGBTQIA+. And so most of my work takes me to the prison. Um, I have attempted to explain to the prisons how people have consensual sex in prison. Um, you put these, um, these folks in, in cages, right? And people fall in love. Um, and it happens. And um, we know that there's about like a five to nine um, times concentration of people living with HIV in the prison systems. 
And that's also true for Massachusetts. And so if we think about people engaging in consensual sex in an area that has such a high concentration of people living with HIV, the likelihood that you may contract HIV yourself uh, is pretty high, right? And so for me, when I told that, I was like, wow, that feels really compelling, a compelling reason to introduce condoms into incarcerated settings or to offer PrEP to people who are incarcerated. Um, and that has been met with such fierce resistance. And somebody mentioned earlier, right? Whose lives do we value and whose do are we able to see as disposable? And so even though the CDC says condoms all day and PrEP, give it away like Skittles, um, that is not the, the mentality in prison. It's, well, if they're gonna do it, well, that's the risk then, and I don't know what to tell you. So that's a real um, point that I'm focused on right now in my work in the commission, um, and also trying to get people hooked up um, on PrEP on their way out the door. So we know people um, using um, IV drugs, right? They're more likely to contract HIV. They should also be on PrEP. And so getting these folks hooked up there as well as LGBT folks. And uh, one thing that I want to talk about that I'm really excited for is that we collaborated. So this is kind of a segue to the last, the last question too. Uh, we actually collaborated with our inside members. So we have 160 inside members incarcerated in Massachusetts. And they, they help collaborate and uh, draft legislation to improve conditions of confinement for queer people and for people living with HIV. And so we're fighting for that bill now in Massachusetts. Um, it would make um, medications uh, for HIV be what's called like keep on person. So people could keep their meds in their cell so that they don't get called out at a regular time throughout the day and have to spend an hour in med line, which is super stigmatizing and another barrier to access your medication, um, more privacy and uh, receiving your med at a regular time every day. That causes a lot of our members angst um, because ultimately they're worried that they'll be forgotten about altogether, which also happened to me while I was incarcerated. Um, and you go up to guard and now you have to disclose, right? And it's, it's messy and not good. Um, and then we also have prep access in that bill as well. And so uh, we're super excited to have made that collaboration. Like we let them write their own legislation. You know, I did some like formatting. We brought it to the state house and we got our bill filed by um, some really dope legislators. And so it's just a really cool like community building moment too of like actually being able to translate for people who are so tr treated as disposable to translate that into policy. Um, yeah, and I'm just so proud of them, all the work that they put in to make that happen. So those are some of the things we're focusing on. But of course, in the community, what we see, I think, as the most one of the most pressing issues are black and brown bodies still contracting HIV and um, and carrying the bulk of new new infections. And so we should all be ashamed of ourselves that that's still happening. Um, those folks should also have access to prep uh, and all the things that other well to do gay white men have access to. Hey, Mike, can I ask you a question about the bill? Yeah, of course. It sounds really exciting. <clears throat> and it reminds me of some work our colleague Annette Gaudino has been doing here in um, New York <clears throat> um, around um, also getting hep C access to uh, people in, that are incarcerated. And I just wanted to know what your group's th thinking had been about that and whether there was a, a thought of including that in the uh, bill since the treatment for hep C is curative and it's only two months. Absolutely. So uh, our civil rights attorneys here in Massachusetts uh, beat us to that punch. They they had to sue the Department of Corrections. And so they're under mandate through the courts to make that happen. Um, and they have rolled out those programs successfully because it's one thing to get a court ruling. It's another thing to make sure it's implemented. Um, but fortunately, they have Im implemented it. Um, the prisons do play some games you know, of like putting on a wait list and, oh, you have to wait for a biopsy and that'll take you nine months, right? And so we'll just wait till you wrap up. Um, so there's there's some issues with making sure people actually have access and opportunity um, to receive the benefits of that court order. Um, and that's something that we do discuss in the commission as well, uh, but certainly something to maybe think about adding to this legislation. Thanks for flagging that. 
great. Thank you so much for all the work you do. Yeah. It represents a kind of intersectionality that is um, going to be vital to our survival over the next 25 years. Yeah. Well, while we're on the topic, prisons are just a public health scourge, right? Where were the biggest clusters of COVID-19 over the past 18 months? Yeah. Prisons and jails. What did prison officials do about it? Nothing. Nothing. Did, did, did begged by, by lawyers and, and families, did, did they let people out of prison who were older, who might have had underlying medical conditions? No. So um, yeah, it, incarceration is a public health issue, not just for HIV and HCV, but for almost all infectious diseases. Um, you know, so it just, it's a scourge. And, and something that I'm noticing as we're talking is that, uh, Michael, you're talking about kind of the way that there's like a waiting game, you know, certain steps will be taken, certain things will be approved, but then actual implementation can take months. And kind of there's, I think this is a common thing we see in activism, especially is, you know, you know, uh, institutions will concede or agree to something and then kind of try to wait out, wait out the activist energy, wait out that, that, that energy. And so, um, kind of what is, what can be done to kind of bring that urgency? You know, we're, we're talking about the history of the movement and how there are all these public demonstrations with ACT UP, but like today, how do we maintain that level of energy and visibility? I mean, I, I want to go back to the, the issue of alliances again, um, because clearly one of the groups that were, you know, started out as adversaries and ended up as allies in the AIDS movement was researchers and clinicians. And one of the biggest most massive effort that was done was about creating really reliable evidence from really large, well-controlled clinical trials about which drugs or other substances work for treatment or prevention or for diagnostics. And the key follow-up on that was to build institutional integrity towards implementing those into public health programs and private in the U.S., unfortunately, private sector programs too. And so there's incredibly powerful groups that put convened by NIH and CDC. They've been in the news a lot lately because they, um, for example, the CDC one, you know, gives the uh, recommendations about how to use the COVID vaccines, but getting a new treatment enshrined into guidelines has been an incredibly important strategy and it's been somewhat successful, but in a country with a fragmented health system like the United States where the states run the Medicaid programs and often underfund them. And the Medicaid programs are the ones that are, you know, where the, where the um, essential workers are treated and where a lot of people of color are treated. They don't often cover those interventions because they're too expensive. Whether it was PrEP back in the old days when it was a monopoly by Gilead, or uh, I don't know how they're gonna handle this new uh, Alzheimer's drug that doesn't work, that's gonna be 56,000 a year plus 30,000 in labs. Um, so having guidelines is not, gonna, is not by itself gonna solve the problem of social inequity, but it can help to build uh, the consensus that say the medical community, the public health community and the activist community all agree that this should be done. And yet it took like more than 10 years from PrEP to be approved in 2010 uh, for, uh, in the US at, for significant numbers of people to actually start being put on PrEP because it was a monopoly drug for nine of those years and um, the cost was prohibitive to a lot of insurers. And so a lot of young, particularly gay men of color and um, also other people of color have become unnecessarily infected with HIV over the last 10 years because the racist American health system did not make their lives a priority. And and kind of with this, there's this um, inside outside strategy that you're talking about, you know, kind of getting the institutions inside to have these guidelines and all that, but also this outside strategy of applying pressure. And I was wondering if maybe anyone else on this panel could kind of speak to how they've navigated inside versus outside strategy. Um, it's a delicate art, I'm sure. Well, I think Mike's the ultimate expert on inside outside. Who is? Mike. Yeah, I was just going to lament about it uh, for a minute with you all. It's so hard um, because, you know, I, 
I am able to do a lot of class passing and use my privilege to get access to spaces, right, with government officials. So, you know, I was able to convince the attorney general of Mass to like put me on this commission. And like, I didn't talk anything about abolition, right? I'm not gonna talk to the AG about that. Um, so I'm like, oh, I'll just try to present well. And I got on the commission, but also how do I effectuate my values while I'm in that room on this commission? Uh, it's very, very hard to try to um, balance my values, right? Like what would my, my comrades say? What would my incarcerated members say if they saw and heard the way I was speaking in a commission meeting, right? Like to try to appeal to the government officials, but at the same time having like a much um, longer like political vision, right? Than whatever's right in front of us. Um, and it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to also then go work with legislators, but then also want to show up and do a direct action, right? And so again, it's very hard um, to navigate all these things. But I think that uh, at least in Massachusetts, I feel like we still pull respect even from government officials, not all of them, um, because we're genuine. We actually don't hide who we are. We're very upfront. We're pretty transparent. Um, and we care about the people that we fight with and fight for. And so, uh, no, I can't go like full hilt to the wall on direct action sometimes or call out everybody I would like to because I do need to maintain some of those relationships uh, and, give, and give them space to also make mistakes sometimes. You know, there's really well-meeting legislators who are about it. Um, and sometimes they're learning as they go too. So I make space for those folks. Um, yeah, it's a very complicated process of uh, trying to hold like abolitionist values and no, not, not everybody holds them. Not everybody sees incarcerated people as valuable, as lovable as people who shouldn't be in cages. Um, yeah, so always trapezing around those, those relationships and dynamics. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, it it seems kind of uh, clear that you guys all have brought to the table like a different perspective of how you um, how you contribute to AIDS and HIV advocacy. And uh, as we're kind of coming to an end of the discussion, I wanted to give all five of you a chance to like comment on uh, what type of advice you would give people who are entering entering the sphere of uh, HIV and AIDS uh, research and or advocacy? Well, I, I would say one thing, um, you know, we really have to uh, care more. And I think there are a lot of people that do care, but they don't know how to get involved. Um, and how they can be of help. And sometimes it takes, it doesn't really take a lot. You know, Sarah Shulman has put out this book now that she's written from the uh, AIDS Oral History Project that she did with Jim Hubbard. And what she's done is she's interviewed, I think 180 members that were part of ACT UP. That isn't like everybody that was a part of it, but a good chunk of it. And what she was trying to find was what in these people's background. If she could find something in their background growing up history, like were they from a political family? Did they have activism? Did they, did they join any other groups before? And she could not find any kind of thread that was common among all the people that were active with ACT UP. And some of them had just come into the group by accident or out of curiosity with a friend. But what's interesting in reading their stories is that a lot of them were exactly where everybody is. Well, what do I do? And when you start to get involved with these groups, you find something that you can do that highlights your interest and your level of, uh, your level of activism or something that you could sort of work with. And it, it, there's, so much you can do. I mean, I think of like the, like this pink and black group. I'm part of a, a group called What Would an HIV Doula Do? And we did this thing where we sat down and wrote pen pal letters to these people. You know, I mean, that's something very simple. Anyone can do that. And it means a lot. And you also learn a lot. 
Um, you know, I think one of the most interesting stories was that I'd heard about was this one woman that had come into a group and she was very sort of like a shy type, but she understood that the pharmaceutical companies or the insurance companies um, were not were not servicing a lot of their clients, particularly with HIV, in an in a way that really serviced them. And she felt like she could just call all these insurance companies up and talk to them because maybe she worked in insurance or something. I haven't gotten to that part of the book. And she made a major change nationally with the way insurance companies worked with people that were affected with HIV and AIDS, just by her own sitting at home, making phone calls, talking to people. So, you know, there's a lot of different levels and ways to become an activist. I mean, of, of course, the most public aggressive ones are the ones that get a lot of attention, but there's a lot of ways to be involved and do activism and make change. And I think when you read Sarah's book and find out all these varying different people that were involved and how they got involved in activism, it just is a model for how anyone can become an activist. I mean, I would say stay angry. Um, there are lots of incentives built into the system to get you to shut up and join the team. I'm sitting at Yale, which like, you know, it's like a CD, we give you George Bush and Bill Clinton, you know? So like, you know, so the point is, is like, you're gonna be given, you know, if you're at MIT, you're gonna be given brass rings to and hoops to jump through and, and get your rewards in that way. Um, but if you think of yourselves as doing the long march to the institutions, and that you're using these institutions to, to leverage power, that's one thing. And then just keep an eye on yourself because um, you can get comfortable um, and, uh, and, and, um, and um, you know, recently I was called out by a, a young friend of mine uh, and I was super angry and annoyed and sad. And then a month later, I realized she was totally right. So like you, you need, you can't get comfortable and you need to stay angry because otherwise you're just gonna get sucked into the system and be a part of the problem. And I totally agree with the stay angry. I think that's a, a I don't think that's too hard right now though. I, I think that there's a lot of material to work with, but I would also say that talking to people, people that you, you see constantly showing up for the same things that you've shown up for and getting to know who they are and finding out why are they there. And you're gonna find out you have things in common and those things that you have in common are may, may be the things that you wanna get involved with and, and, and rally around and organize together and work with. And you know when you see that you need the, maybe someone else's kind of experience, maybe you ask them to help you out. But a lot of it is that being in the same room with somebody, even like us, even this kind of virtual room, but looking somebody in the eye and realizing that, you know, you're, you're there for each other. And then how, how do we work together to move forward, to change things for the good and, and, you know, keep it moving. But I do think that the anger part of it is definitely the, there's that, the fire under your butt for that, you know? I would absolutely echo the anger thing. Boy, when I'm angry, I can write my socks off. Um, yeah, so it definitely keeps the sense of urgency there. Urgency. Uh, and something that you all spoke about, though, sounded like also leaning into love a lot, right? Love of our community, love of the people that we fight for and fight with. Um, and that can help us from being maybe consumed by the anger, right? You kind of need some balance because you're going to want to still remember how to human, uh, right? Um, and the last thing I would say is keep your imagination. Um, if you go for formal training, that will try to get snuffed out of you. Um, I remember Fenway Community Health, which is like our LGBT health center here in Mass. They kind of tout themselves as a leader um, in the field. And I went through their like getting to zero activist um, kind of training program they did not cover any direct actions. And I kept saying, what about ACT UP? What about TAG? What about all that dope work that the direct action gets the goods, right? And they were like, oh, no, no, they minimized it. And so 
don't don't ever uh, count out direct actions. They get the goods. You get the press cycle. You get all the visibility for the issues that you're so passionate about. Um, so definitely, definitely keep that imagination. And uh, and sometimes don't worry what other people think. Just go Absolutely. for it. Absolutely. I have one last book to recommend. Um, it's called uh, Love and Rage, and it's by Lamarad Owens. He's a black queer Buddhist monk and activist and I've been reading it a lot um, recently because with all the 40 years of AIDS um, and all the other sort of nonsense that's been out there in the media, the, um, the fundamental truth for me at least was that my activism was driven by love for my community and by our love for each other and a belief that even though not everyone was gonna make it, some of us would make it. And a lot of times the rage that fueled so much of our activism really was built on a, a framework of love. And the, the fact that we were, you know, going from being an isolated queer 28 year old in the East Village with friends who were beginning to die to being uh, one month later surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of, of loving queer activists and a few straight women um, was really utterly transformative to me in my life and created a path for, for activist work that continues to this day that, that has created paths for working with people all around the world. Um, and I'm very, very proud of the origins of our work together, Joy and Rodney and Greg here in New York in those very, very dark days in the 80s and the early 90s. And, um, and I wanna remember how much more there is to do. And I think for younger people, one thing that I came, came out of this hearing a lot and was that a lot of people just don't know what happened. And so it's gonna be so important to com complete the work of telling the stories of the people we've lost and the people that we haven't lost, but the traumatized and to heal them and to heal our world. And that's enough for many, many lifetimes. Awesome. Do you know, I have to say that there was this period, um, if you remember, there was a period that was very difficult for gay men, particularly in the 80s, where it was believed that all gay people were carriers and they wanted to quarantine us and tattoo us to keep the rest of society safe, which was a ridiculous idea because, you know, it kind of, we're, we're too intertwined with families and love and a lot of other things to keep it together. But I, I was like guilty, guilty. I, well, I, I could say guilty because I did all the same stuff that all these friends that I know died, right? And I'm saying, why them and not me? So I believed for years that I would eventually zero convert. I couldn't believe that I didn't. And it took me about 10 or 12 years after being tested regularly to realize, for a while I realized I was infected, but it wouldn't show up. So I treated myself as though I was infected because I believe that there was something, some people were under, the virus couldn't detect in their body, but they could still transmit it to people. And then I, it took me a while to realize, well, if I'm here and they're all gone, I must be here for a reason. And my reason, I, I began to believe that I was really here to do the work that I'm doing because they needed me to do that when they were alive and they need me to continue it after they're gone. And that's what really what drives me. So it's more, uh, as I said, love for my community and love for these friends that have left behind and how I'm left to still carry on the work and their legacy and what can be possible. And my work through uh, working with this doula group is that we realize that the whole thing about HIV goes through stages. There's before you're infected where you're just out there and you think you're fine. Then when you get your diagnosis, that's another life. And then what happens after your diagnosis and the people around you. And I become concerned with all stages of it, including people that aren't HIV positive because um, you know, you're living in a world where, it's the way that I see it, half the world is. You can't pretend that they don't exist, even though nobody's talking about it. And I'm trying to get people to talk about it, to make it more comfortable, because I really think we do. And that's when 
you start to find out that people are really curious and interested, but they really feel uncomfortable about talking about it because nobody is, which was why the event that we did. Oh, sorry, you were muted. Yeah. <laughs> did I just mute myself in the middle of talking? Yeah. 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 No, so 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 th th there was this this hunger for people to really talk about, it. and I had a lot of questions, particularly the younger generation. You know, it was like amazing to me, and they're like really really ready, and they were so thankful. You know, with any little bit of information that we gave them, or just to listen to what they had to say. They've never even had any. They've never been able to talk freely about what was going on in their minds, what they were thinking, what they were feeling to anyone. And to have someone that was sitting there and saying, yes, I'm really interested and I really want to know meant a lot. And there needs to be a lot more of that. Yeah, and it, it sounds like a couple of things. First, you've all kind of expressed the sentiment of having love for each other, but also anger and trying to use both sides of that to feel your work. And, and sir, what you're saying about bringing in the younger generation, um, I think it's documentaries such as How to Survive a Plague that people have access to, but also all of these resources that you've all been sharing throughout this panel that can really help people get engaged and kind of join this movement um, that, that's continuing today. And um, now that we're out of time, I, I wanna respect that and just say thank you so much to all of you for, for coming here today um, and taking your time to speak with us and um, this is a very inspirational um, panel to be a part of. And um, yeah, just thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks yeah. everyone. It was really wonderful to be with all of you. Thank you. Happy Pride. Yes, happy Pride. <laughs> I hope you get to celebrate everyone. Yeah. And I'll be opening up. Okay. Great. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, everyone.